This was originally my mom's PowerPoint for her presentation, so that's why it looks like that. But um, <laughs> um, my name is Tessa Decker. I'm 18 years old, and I have two brothers with Wisca and one healthy brother. Um, they are now 35, 34, and 32. Um, when I was born, my brothers were very sick. They were 16, 15, and 13. My parents went through a lot just to have me. My parents created me in the hopes of curing my brother, John Jr. John Jr. was the sickest of the two, and Josh had already had a bone marrow match in our brother, Tyler. My parents found out early in the pregnancy that I also matched Josh. I have always felt like a huge disappointment to them and mostly to my brother, John Jr., who I watched battle through autoimmune hemolytic anemia, ITP, a splenectomy, and testicular cancer, and I knew I couldn't save him. I was there every day through Josh's bone marrow transplant and helped my mom clean and care for his central line. When I was eight years old, I found out that I had the exact same Wiscott defect as my brother, John. I had been having lots of the same symptoms as my brother's, petechiae infections, bruising. So the MIH tested me as well. They were very surprised to find out that I am asymptomatic Wiscott carrier. Growing up, knowing all this has been both a blessing and a curse. My mom has always been very honest with me about everything, so I've always known that my brothers could die of this disease, that my own symptoms could turn into cancer, and that I can now carry this on to my future children. I have learned so much about Wiscott and autoimmune disease by watching and listening to my mom and by doing my own research. This Josh getting his bone marrow transplant. Uh, is that an elliptical? Yeah. Yeah. He, how old was he at transplant? 16. Um, yeah. Didn't you say he, he played a game of basketball for school and then he went and had his, his chemo. So, um, that's me. <laughs> um, I have learned so much about Wiscott and autoimmune disease by watching and listening to my mom and by doing my own research. She has taught me to be my own, my own advocate for my health. That's John with the black eye. No. Me and my brother Tyler are both matches for Josh. Josh. Yeah. So that's Tyler in the middle, Josh is over here, and John's over there. We, overall, we are a pretty, a pretty positive family and try not to dwell on the negative because things could always be worse. My brother John was never cured. That's when he had testicular cancer. Uh, his seminoma was actually in his chest, crushing his windpipe. Um, and that only happens in like, what was it, 1%, 2% of, of all the cases. Um, how old was he, 18? 19, 18, 19. John continues to live a, a fun-filled life with his wife and two children. He coaches his son's basketball and soccer teams. That was him in high school, high school baseball. Um, he was never allowed to play football, um, but did he play baseball his whole high school or just, yeah. Um, my brother Tyler, the healthy one, um, my parents didn't let him play football either just because it wasn't fair for him to be able to play and not the others. Um, but after Josh received his transplant, his senior year, he was able to play football for the first time. John was only supposed to live till age two, and he is now 35. That was at Tyler's wedding, all of us. As John and his family, uh, his daughter is 14 and his son's 10. 
Um, so his daughter is a carrier, but they haven't told her. Um, so she doesn't really know. Um, they know that when their dad gets into an ITP episode, he has to have um, chemo. And he gets, John gets IVIG every other week at uh, University of Michigan uh, to keep his platelets up um, and his counts good. Um, but it doesn't seem to be affecting him. He, uh, he works from the hospital on his laptop and uh, then he goes and coaches baseball at night. So, um, as I said, my brother Josh was cured um, by our brother Tyler. Um, he is now a carpenter and um, builds a ton of amazing things. Uh, he built a, um, yeah, he frames houses. He built a deck all by himself, like the the past month and. Uh, um, that's him. <laughs> and, um, the chemo actually, the chemo that he had actually damaged his hair so bad that it never grew back all the way. So, um, it bothered him for a really long time, but now he's, he doesn't really, doesn't really care. So, he used to wear hats all the time. But, um. That's the healthy one, Tyler, and his two sons, and his wife. And that's me. <laughs> um, but yeah, despite everything they've been, th um, they've both been through. Um, they continue to live full, healthy lives, even though John still has Westcott. Um, he deals with it as it comes. Uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, his, uh, his splenectomy was when he was 18. And what are his platelets run like with IVIG? They run like what? 150 now uh, with IVIG every other week. So. Our first speaker is going to be Don Johnson, and whose father, Jonathan Johnson, is also here, and they're both happy to take questions after this. We'll be followed by Tessa, we'll introduce her later. Thank you, Don. Thank you. So um, this is my family's mutation, which is very rare, um, which is one of the reasons why we chose to do transplant in my son. But um, last time at conference, we found out that there was only other one family in Italy that they know of with this mutation. So, so this is my dad's grandmother and grandfather William. William died um, of tuberculosis at, after an extended illness at the age of 44. So we kind of think that maybe it came from him. We're not, you know, obviously we don't know for sure. But um, this is my grandma and grandpa, Wayne and Alice. Alice obviously was the carrier because she gave it to my dad. My dad is on the left, making sure that my I get you know the mirror images. But um, there were four boys. First boy was born stillborn um, in '45. So whether he was born stillborn due to uh, delivery trauma or just because he didn't fit. As my, my grandma said that there was no way she was going to be able to have that baby and eventually she did deliver but he was um, born stillborn. So we don't know, you know, back then they, they tried to do CPR but it did not work. Second boy, um, Douglas Wayne, was born in 47 and he passed away after two months in Montevideo Hospital and two months in Minneapolis due to tubercular meningitis. He had um, we know that he had two spinal taps in Montevideo, but and several IVs of antibiotics, but um, to no, no avail, he did not make it. And my grandma was in a solarium at this time, or not a solarium, what do they call him? Dad. Sanitarium for tuberculosis as well. 
So um, at first they told my grandfather that he was just fussy due to missing his mom, but lo and behold. Um, William Richard would be my uncle, Bill, who is not affected. We know this because um, finally while my son was in transplant, my cousin decided that she was going to be tested because she realized that her father was never going to do it because he hated needles. So she was not a carrier, so we know that um, Bill is unaffected. And then my dad, who's sitting there, was born in 52 on the 30th of December, and he has not had a transplant. He just has lived his life as normally as can as he can, without and not knowing why he was bruised all the time until Roderick came along. So they both um, grew up on a farm, lots of playing in the dirt, as you can see, standing in the mud puddle. Um, if Grandma only knew, <laughs> she was kind of a, I don't know, she, she had tr nurse training, so she was always kind of uh, hovering over me and my brother because we grew up on the same farm, and she was always there working parents, so she was kind of our little guardian. So if we got in a fight, she always made everything better. If we were bleeding, she fixed us. But uh, So Dad once sat on an old antique bandsaw as a small child and had a big cut and didn't ended up not bleeding to death. But he also has 80,000 platelets, where my son only averaged 30. And every time he was sick, he would be under 10. So there, there's kind of a bit of a difference between there. Um, and once when chopping trees, he had an axe, little hatchet that he got stuck in the back of his head. He was up by the house, and he went all the way out to the field to tell Grandpa because he was afraid to tell Grandma because he thought he was going to get in trouble, which I'm sure he did. But uh, we have lots of pictures of him as a toddler, riding horse, um, just living life as any other normal farm kid. No helmets, no nothing. He survived measles and the chicken pox. So, you know, <laughs> me being here, I think, is kind of a miracle. But you can see, you know, Grandma took a lot of pictures, so it's dated September of 59, but it might have been a little bit before that. Um, had some very interesting toys, which looking back, Gra Grandma probably, if she knew, probably wouldn't have given them boxing gloves for Christmas. <laughs> But uh, he had but was in two car accidents as a child. Um, had some front teeth knocked out, but he, you know he survived it just fine. Um, when he was 25, this was my brother would have been about nine months old. Um, that summer he had I don't know, did you jump off the bailing rack and then is that. Okay, so he's switching bailing racks, and um, his legs pretty much bruised up to his knees. And they went in, and that's when they found out he had um, his platelets were really low. And that entire summer, he was in and out of the hospital, low platelets. They gave him um, steroids, yeah. <laughs> and we're preparing to take out his spleen when magically they just came up. But during this time, my little brother, who was nine months old, was sitting on my dad, and you know how little babies like to stick their fingers in everything? Well, he stuck his finger in my dad's nose and almost caused him to bleed to death. So, and dad got chewed out by the doctors. I told you to take it easy, but they finally got his nose to stop bleeding after how many cauterizations and... They, you know, wanted to take out his spleen, but they didn't, thank goodness. And he, I was born a year later. So a little bit of uh, looking at the two of them. My dad's platelets are at 80,000, whereas Roderick's are only normally at 30,000, unless he's sick, and then they would fall. Um, and then the severe ITP, um, when his platelets fell below 10,000, he has high cholesterol and high blood pressure, which is a little weird with the low platelets, but, and we don't, we really don't know what his immune function is. He's never been tested, and I keep trying to get him to go to an immunologist, but, you know, um, I think since Grandma's not here telling him what to do, may, maybe I'll just have to step up a little higher and just making him, 
yeah, make him, make him an appointment and make him go. Um, one of the reasons why we decided to transplant Roderick was because of the immune function. You know, sometimes it would be good, and then the next time we'd check, it was there. There was nothing. So it was like, you know, this confusion between, you know, sometimes he's good, sometimes he's well, and we can never tell if he's good or bad. Um, I could always tell when his platelets were low. I mean, you know, we can all relate. He'd just brush his face and he'd get petechiae. You know, so it was like we we could always tell when his platelets were low. It was just you know, what's going to happen when he's bigger and not taking care of himself. Um, and the other reason why we decided was because he had a perfect match sibling donor and his non-carrier sister, Tori, who is 15 months younger than him, um, which we were very lucky to have her because once we found out that Roderick was, um, it was a genetic issue, we quickly decided that we weren't having any more kids and my husband um, had surgery when he had hernia surgery as well. So, you know, we feel very lucky in the fact that um, A, she is not, a, neither of my girls are carriers um, and that she was such a perfect match. So perfect that the doctor um, at first when she was looking at, his, at their um, HLA type, she thought that she had two Rodericks because you know you do several swabs and she's like oh the lab screwed up and then she looked back and nope this one's a girl and this one's a boy so I, she had only seen one other match this close and that was in a set of identical twins so that was um, one of the major reasons we weren't going to do it except for the fact that we had a perfect match. Um, and the other reason is uh, Roderick is, you know, you couldn't tell from the way he behaved yesterday, but that kid, and he, he goes 90 miles an hour. When he was six months old, he was on top of our couch. I mean, he was the climber. He wanted to do everything. He had an older sister who he wanted to do everything she did. So if she was riding horse, he wanted to ride horse. And um, he always was... You know, we always had a helmet on him. We always had pads on him. We always, you know, we always did all these things to protect him. But, you know, you just felt like no matter what you did, you could never completely keep him safe. And um, right before conference last year, the reason why I decided to come to conference, or two years ago, was he had um, bumped himself, and we brought him to the ER. And it was the first time we went to the ER when Children's was closed. And I called Children's and said, um, we're bringing him in. We got to the ER. The ER doctor called Children's to talk to the on-staff person, and she's like, she wants to talk to you. And I'm like, okay, weird. <laughs> and she gets on the phone, and or I get on the phone, and she's like, if you know he has Wiscott, why hasn't he been transplanted? And I'm like, uh, uh. Well, because he does fairly well, you know. So that was like, I never realized that there were, I mean, I knew there were other opinions, but, you know, I just assumed that my doctor's opinion was pretty much the opinion of all the doctors of children's, you know, how you just assume things. So after that, I kind of got my wheels turning, and we went to conference and learned a lot about it. And, you know, I didn't even, we didn't, at that point, we didn't know if Tori and Roderick were a match, and I felt like, kind of felt cheated by the doctors, like, why didn't, why didn't we look into this? But um, after that, we looked into it, found out, and then the kicker, the big kicker, the, the reason why I called the team and set up the appointment to see, to do HLA type testing and stuff like that was, we were at my stepsister's son's birthday party, who is two weeks older than Roderick, and they were playing, and Roderick had his helmet on, and he was climbing through the jungle gym and um, like his normal self going 90 miles an hour and his helmet got caught between the boards and there he hung. And um, after that, I decided, yep, we're doing it. We can't risk this anymore. Things that are keeping him safe are hurting him. And, um, you know, he had the claw marks trying to get his strap unbuckled. And after that, I decided, no, nope, I'm not risking this. If we can, if we can fix this, we're going to fix it. And um, the doctor had asked me, you know, she's like, if this was you, and you were sick, and you couldn't do the things you wanted to do, would you do it to yourself? 
risking death. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I grew up, I played hockey, I rode horse, I, you know, 90 miles an hour all the time. I, it was just not one of those things that, you know, I had to worry about. And um, so these are the reasons why we did it. Um, but let me tell you, quality of life, yeah, I might be a little um, weepy-eyed about the whole situation and like the, with the survivor's guilt and stuff like that, but um, we go home and we play and I don't worry about him hardly at all. I mean, yesterday I was a little worried. I kept checking him for a fever because, you know, you never really quite get over that, but, um, you know, he's going to hockey camp in September. He's riding his pony this summer. You know, he's doing what he wants to do and I don't have to um, say no. You can't do that. We bought, bought him a trampoline for Christmas, <laughs> which, you know, we go to all our cousin's house and he's like, why can't I jump on the trampoline? You know, so it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, and, and could it have turned out differently? Yes, very easily. Um, we were very lucky with his match and I mean, he, his count came in at day eight. He never, he had like two little mouth sores, you know, it was, it, it, we were very lucky through transplant. Um, he was out at like, I want to say day, what was it, day 15, and it would have been earlier, except they couldn't get us family training quick enough, you know. It, and not every transplant is like that guaranteed, but um, we are very blessed in the fact that it went as well as it did, and the University of Minnesota which is two and a half hours from our house. You know, we had the Mayo, which is like seven hours away, and we had the U, which is two and a half hours away. You know, they're, what, two and three in the nation for transplant success, so it was like, we picked the one that was closer to home, just for the sake that parents could come, and they had a really good relationship with, um, our hematologist and immunologist, so that's why we chose the U. But, you know, they each room had a separate ventilation system. You know, they had one floor dedicated to transplants. They had um, healthcare partners that came and they would have kids, or not kids, but college kids, because it's right on U campus, that would volunteer to spend time with your kid so you could go shower. We only used them once or twice because Roderick at that time was kind of timid, you know, um, and both of us were there and my mom was always there to help on the weekends and stuff like that. So it was a very, they had, they had it down and they knew the only thing we had issues with was meds and we um, wasn't expecting that because he took his meds so well before. So at day, day negative, what was it, negative 11, three, three days into chemo and he stopped taking Tylenol. It was like, what? No, do you? <laughs> you know, but uh, we got through it and he got through it. Um, we traumatized the nurses at home when he had IVIG. We had to give him Benadryl and Tylenol liquid and he hates taking liquid now. He'll, he'll take a pill. He'll take 20 pills before he, he will take a milliliter of liquid, but uh, he, uh, he he's very... Um, What's the word? He recovered quick. I mean, he just, he rolls with the punches and he goes. But, and he, he'll, he, if you wanted to ask him any questions about it, he'd be happy to answer them too. But, any, any other questions? Any questions? How old was he? He was five. He turned five in August and was, his transplant on, was on December 2nd and he will be seven in August. No graphers, so right. Yeah, he just thought he had low platelets for whatever reason.
And that, and that was, you know, we were the only transplant on the floor that had a sibling match. And there was, what, 15 families? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. That's where I'm confused because when my brother was diagnosed with ICP as a young boy, and that's the reason they told my mom he had those places, but he never had anything from it. It was just the fact that he had those places. They had to put a title to it, a reason, so they blanketed him with ICP. And then later on, they realized it was probably it was that he had the wit back. So I'm wondering, was your, just because my son just got the first piece of ICP, he was already did you, did you actually test for those No, he's never. Like, he, they, they never. And he, they don't have the medical he records. Didn't actually have, like, he just had a, a flare of your wisdom. Right. Yeah. 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 He, he, yeah, his, his, he was brown from his toes to his knees. Okay, so maybe it was an ICP actual. Yeah, because, yeah, and normally they were at 80,000, and then they were like, they were 10, around that 10 all summer long. Have you had any, have you had anything come back? Have you had another case of ICP or severe active bleeding I mean, other than the nose picking incident? No. Which was which was when he had that the low oh, okay. low low platelets, and he yeah he he might not agree, but I I think it, it takes him longer to get over colds, it, you yeah. know that type of thing, but yeah, and. No. Nothing. No. They they don't they don't even they don't even know if his immune system is working or not, and it just drives me nuts. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. 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 I would not be here. <laughs> right. 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 He so he he has a CBC what once a year when you have an annual exam, and that's pretty much it. So I mean, I guess in a way he's kind of being watched. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to I'll ha I'll have to settle for that. But yeah. Right. Right. He, yeah, and then I, I get everybody worked up and mad because they think I'm crazy. <laughs> Do you have the money? One brother oh, living. Was he affected? No. Was he affected? I'm sorry, I wasn't here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, he's had... He, he's had some... He started getting the... Um, what was the one you had for um, the respiratory pneumonia? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's the other funny thing. Roderick had all his vaccines. So he started kindergarten before transplant, and he had, had all his vaccines. So when he went back to kindergarten this fall, because he only went for six weeks, but when he went back to kindergarten, they're like, they must have, the state of Minnesota must have changed something with the guidelines for the MMR shot. And they're like, he needs his MMR. And I'm like, okay, first of all, this is so after he's been in school for four weeks. 
I'm like, first of all, he's supposed to be in a vaccinated class and you're not taking care of this until now. Um, and the other thing is, is he, yeah, he doesn't have his whatever third shot of MMR, but um, technically he doesn't have any of his shots. <laughs> and they're like, well, we just, we, well, then we need the doctor to sign off on it. I'm like, okay, whatever. I just did a family waiver or whatever because to get the doctor's signature is kind of a pain to go to the cities but uh you know it's funny people don't how they don't understand i'm like i thought i thought we had this all straightened out you know you knew that he was unvet or you know was at risk for these diseases and that's why he was supposed to be in a vaccinated class but i don't know you could yes there is yes there is so you know it's one of those things that yeah, quite a few. All and it's like we're going through the airport, and I'm like, "Don't touch anything! Don't touch anything! Don't look at anybody!" <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Great. So I, I don't think we really need the microphone, but I guess it's important for us to try to have it so that we can record it afterwards, so it can be recorded and others who aren't able to be here can be here. So as I kind of mentioned, this is our time to talk about whatever we'd like to talk about as families. And isn't so much for me to be, me, you know, you guys, many of you saw me yesterday. It's not for me to talk at you. It's actually for us to learn from each other. And so I'll be kind of loosely moderating the discussion, but really it's really a time for us to talk about these issues that we have brought up during the sessions and so um, that are important to our families. So I'll just open it up for folks to talk about things that they might want to talk about as a group and um, about the experience of being a family member um, or a person with Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Sure, that'd be, yeah, because a lot of people may do not So I'm Christina Mangurian. I'm a psychiatrist um, working at UCSF, um, and I'm also a mom. My son Anderson had uh, has what's got Aldrich syndrome. He had a bone marrow transplant in 2012 um, from a non-sibling um, match donor. Um, it was a uh, cord blood treatment, um, and he had um, just a mild uh, G graft versus host skin afterwards. Now he's fine. He's very, you will see him later. He's coming. He'll be enjoying going to Disneyland. He's a feisty five-year-old. Um, and he's got an older, do older sister, Simone, who's nine. Um, and as I mentioned uh, yesterday, we don't, we have not yet had her tested. I don't know her carrier status. David Clark, my son has Wiscott, but I'll let my medical expert explain the family history. My name is Christina Clark. Um, five years ago, our son was diagnosed with Wiscott, and it led to, actually, he was almost diagnosed with ITP until I mentioned that my brothers have always had low blood platelets, which I n always knew meant my brother bled easily, or actually he didn't, he bruised easily, um, but I never really knew what that meant. It was just words in our house that were spoken like this other language. Um, and so it turns out that in fact, not just my son was diagnosed, um, but two of my brothers and many of my cousins or my cousin's sons, um, because it turns out my, br my mother's brother also had Wiscott. He died in the 90s from HIV, which he may have been able to live with had he known he also had Wiscott. Um, and then many other family members, it turns out, um, in the sticks in Tennessee where my mom's from, it was just called the family's blood disorder. And all the men had it and nobody thought anything of it <laughs> until I came around. So, um, But David did, has not had any course of treatment. Um, other than we do monthly IVIG. He is pretty basically healthy, um, other than like dealing with some social psychological issues, I guess, um, struggling with, I think, how to deal with it and make his own and be his own. Um, but he is six, almost seven. Next week he'll be seven. So you all will probably already, you've already met him or will meet him tonight. 
Hi, I'm Krista Ompu, and I'm from Toronto, and my son uh, is with Scott. He'll be three in a few weeks. He's not had a transplant. Um, I guess he's considered to have the one of the common mild mutations, so it's basically a battle of what to do. Um, generally, he's been really, really well. Just, I think starting in January, he's been getting quite a few nosebleeds, though, and those will last a good two hours at a time. Um, so that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, but he is a very super, super active boy. I'm hoping next conference I can bring him. Um, but the challenge basically now is just trying to figure out what to do. I think the plan is to just take it a day at a time and hopefully he stays well. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at right now. Uh, I'm Jana, I'm from Israel, and of course I'm also a mother of a uh, mayor who is uh, one year old and three months, and he has the uh, mild with Kai. I'm actually also a PhD student in biology, that's why it looks like I understand <laughs> most of what's presented. Um, and that's it, we just, uh, he, now we're not thinking about transplant, but it's always uh, an open question. Um, we're just dealing from day to day and trying to keep him safe with the helmet. Uh, his immune system is fine. He's not, uh, thank God, not uh, constantly sick or anything. Um, that's it. Okay. Thanks. My name is Amir. Amir Kedar. I'm from Israel also. My son has the same mutation like we are, I think, three of us here. And uh, he's eight years old. He has two older sisters, 19 and 16. I don't know if they're carriers. We still didn't decide not to... Well, we talked about it with them, but generally we didn't test it yet. Um, we decided not to do the, the transplantation based on our own research. And uh, he's really well, so there aren't any specific things that I think, except of bruising, He's very active also, so he looks like a small tiger, you know, with all these uh, bumps. Uh, he had, in one year, he had two or three times nose bleeding, but for a very short time, 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Mainly we discovered that this was connected to a virus. When uh, we had, he had three times this, in three times he had virus, you know, different thing, but this was only one year. Since that time, three years, I think he didn't have anything. Um, that's all. Hello, my name is Natalia. Um, my son, who is um, three and a half years old now, was diagnosed with Viscid Aldrich when he was five months old. Um, and we have family history. My brother died uh, when he was one year and eight months old. Um, when he was alive, he was not diagnosed. Um, it was in Russia about 35 years ago. And um, so the doctor called my mom after he died and said that she found his disease. Um, he had severe eczema, he was always sick, he had low platelets, so pretty much everything that um, people with Viscid Aldrich have, with classic Viscid Aldrich. So um, it helped us with diagnosis, and he was diagnosed at five months. At nine months, he had bone marrow transplant from his sister. Um, she was a perfect match, and <laughs> doctors were actually also surprised, saying, like, everything is exactly the same. So. We were lucky, and um, our daughter was almost three at the time of transplant, and she she was excited to donate her bone marrow to save her brother. So that was very humbling to see. Um, he's doing well now. Um, he went through transplant really well and uh, didn't have any major issues. Had some mucositis and um, mild and moderate graft versus host disease in his. Uh, stomach and gut, but it resolved, and so he's doing well now. I'm Robin Seacrest from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I think my story may echo yours a little bit, Natalia. Uh, this is Sam. He's our Wiscott Aldrich uh, bone marrow transplant survivor. Um, he, and he will um, attest to you that if your children are very young, he doesn't remember anything at all. So although we suffered through the pain for him, um, 
he doesn't remember. So that's, that was one of the benefits of maybe having it when he was young. Um, he presented with everything except the bloody diarrhea. So um, when it first happened, though, of course, nobody knew what it was. He, when, in hindsight's 2020, and when we look back, he had everything that was uh, typical for a Wiscott Aldrich um, patient. I will tell you that this is our first experience with IDF and our first experience with the Wiscott Aldrich Foundation. Um, we knew nothing, and I'm, I'm actually coming here not prepared because <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. Um, but we were in um, Columbus, and it was a situation where he was a toddler. He was one and a half, and he was falling as he was learning to walk and pull himself up. And he fell, and he would have these just crazy bruises all over his body. Um, and I think I said something, my husband came home from work, and I said, yeah, he fell off the front step while he was trying to walk. And he was like, that shouldn't happen, like, that fast. So we took him to the pediatrician. Um, and while I was there, I bent down to pick him up, and the buckle on my watch ran across his arm, and he bruised right in front of all of us. Um, and they suspected leukemia. So he told me just to take him straight to the uh, Children's Hospital in Columbus emergency room. Um, and of course, when I got there, the first question they asked me was all about um, abuse. I mean, it was, is he in a daycare center? Who watches him? You know, and, the, and, and it was just not being informed. I think the, so I was like, I, I'm, you know, fortunate enough, I was able to take off from work and I was home with him. I said, he's with me all day long. Um, so of course, then multiple tests and through, um, that was Memorial Day, and so through the whole summer, um, when he was, I think that was 10 months, and he turned one July 3rd, um, he, we would do an ITP, and we were in um, frequently for the steroid, some kind of steroid um, medication, and finally, uh, we got in touch with somebody that fortunately did his, um, Oh my gosh, I can't think of what it's called. Like fellowship under Dr. Filipovich in Cincinnati. And he said, I am the chief of staff for the immune you know, department over here. He said, I could say, keep him with me, but we've got the best, uh, a 90 mile drive south, so go check her out. And she was amazing. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> if you've not been able to look at her research or contact her, she saved his life, and um, it was the most remarkable experience that we went through, but he had to have a bone marrow transplant. He had the severe case of Wiscott Aldrich, and like you, our daughter was um, a perfect match beyond the 10 out of 10 that she needed to be, so she's his hero, and um, every November 22nd, we have a transplant anniversary celebration. Um, and they do follow him, so now it's just the next steps of, of the growth. And it was what I was hoping to hear about, which they say is not enough data, um, the growth and development and the, um, uh, you know, the fertility issues and, and things like that that are unknown. So we'll wait and see what happens. Um, but other than that, he's, he's cured. He's just everything that any, like he doesn't even know what it is or what happened or anything. So, um, but we do, obviously, so. Um, the, the situation with the bone marrow transplant, I mean, that went well. I, I definitely would encourage you to contact Cincinnati Children's Hospital for, for information. I mean, they, they just knew what they were doing. And, and um, so anyways, if you were, if you're researching, I would definitely encourage you to contact them. Um, he did have a couple of incidents with, um, his port, he had three times the port go in because I think he was such an active child, he kept pulling it out um, to the point where we had to have somebody stay in the room the third time overnight to make sure uh, it stayed. And, um, and we did have to go back to the hospital a few times with infections during that transplant uh, period, but um, prayers and um, support really helped. Another um, thing that I would encourage you to look into is called uh, CODA. Uh, if you've not heard of CODA, C-O-T-A, they are the Children Organ Transplant Association, and they help do fundraising to help um, pay for anything that is related to uh, your child's transplant organization. So if the hospitals don't have that information, I think it was real helpful for them to share that. Um, but 
they are fabulous uh, charitable organization. Um, a dollar for dollar goes towards your child for his life. Um, and they just, they make their funding off of the um, uh, interest or whatever, whatever they, what they do. So they're, they're a very good organization. So they were helpful to us also. Hi. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Nadav, I'm from Israel. Um, <clears throat> I'm father to Ido, who is uh, two and a half years old, as a um, classic was. Um, we found it out at uh, the age of uh, five months, um, with the great help of a very good uh, pediatrician, who also connected us to the, the right doctors. Um, and with a, a lot of help of Amir. Um, and um, about now, Ido, like you see, maybe some of them be, of, of you saw a few days ago, Ido is doing very, very good. He's gone through a, a BMT, an unrelated donor. Um, the first uh, few months were great, uh, perfect. And we, I mean, it was, uh, I thought it was too fast. But um, after three months, uh, th uh, the uh, results um, started to, to drop a little bit. And um, and um, now it stands for a 50% 50, 50, 50 chimera with a 90% uh, general chimera and a 90% uh, uh, lympho lymphocyte uh, uh, chimerism, which is good. And our main problem is, uh, is that the platelets, which uh, I see as a, as a trend uh, because it has a linear, uh, linear uh, trend. Um, and now it stands for 40K. And um, that's it. Uh, Ox uh, said to me that uh, you should look at your child and uh, observe him. So I'm looking at him. He's, he's amazing. Uh, so um, it's just the patechia and, uh, and the bruises. And um, I would uh, I hear the stories, the amazing stories, inspiring stories. And I just will sign on this situation. And uh, I would like to say bye to the to the wife. <laughs> That's my story. Hi, I'm Donna Decker, and I've lived with Wiscott for 35 years. Um, my dad died of it um, when I was nine years old. He died of spinal meningitis. He was not diagnosed until my kids were diagnosed. So I've got quite a story. Um, planning on writing a book, actually, um, because I've got so much to say. And my son, John, is begging me to write a book because of uh, his children, actually and he wants them to know everything, and so much has happened. So, um, but, um, so I've got the two boys who were born with Wiscott. Uh, John's 35, Josh is 34, who had a transplant. John has not, and I've got Tyler, and then we had Tessa, um, because John did not have a donor, so we re reversed our, my tubes because um, that thought was out there. Um, she was a triplet. We lost the other two, had her. Um, because we had kept one in the uterus and so we kind of just lightly um, kept me under sedation to remove the ectopic pregnancy while one miscarried and saved her. Um, so she's not a disappointment, <laughs> though she may have always felt that she is the light of my life and my best friend. And um, um, she looks exactly like her brother John, which um, more so than his own daughter, which people think she is his daughter, not his own daughter. Um, she, um, when she was born, actually, my husband and I were in tears because we were worried that she was his replacement um, because she looked so much like him. But, um, you know, everywhere, she's a lifeguard, and actually she asked him to make, a, he's a graphic designer and he's a CAD operator, so he draws all of our blueprints for our company, and he, um, she asked him to make her some business cards for her to teach private lessons, and he sent her, and it just made me cry when she sent it to me, a design 
um, and he just drew a business card and he just said world's greatest sister and I just wanted to cry <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but that's less than a nutshell really um, and Robin I'm glad so glad you had a great experience with Dr. Filipovich because we did not when we took our boys when they were 11 and 12 to see her um, she just looked at our, their test results handed them back to us and told us to go home take them home and prepare for their last days um, she would not give us the time of day and um, and she just said Josh would never survive a transplant at his age and John had no hope in hell and um, that was that and I saw her a couple conferences ago and she would not even speak to me so you know and see she would not you know and that was now so many other studies have come out and there are other patients you know, that are John's age and have survived. So obviously, you know, she was just focused on babies and that was it. And, you know, hopefully her eyes have been opened that there are other options out there um, because my son is doing very well. He does take precautions, Dr. Blaze. I don't know if any of you know Dr. Mike Blaze, but he has always told me, and this is something we have really lived with. He has always said, stay ahead of the disease. Um, and that's something we have always lived by. Um, and if your sons are splenectomized, they have to be on their penicillin. They cannot go off that penicillin. Um, Dr. Blaze told me that that's when he started losing patients is when they became older and decided, eh, I'm good, and they stopped. Um, John is very diligent about it. Um, luckily, he does work with my husband and um, we do still monitor those pills. And um, so my husband is on him about it. Did you take your penicillin? Did you take your penicillin? And it is nag, but you know, dad, you know, yes. And she said, I, I don't care. You're 35, I don't care. I better not ever find out you're not taking your penicillin. And I will report back, you know, he, you know, would have been here, but he's in Columbus actually at a baseball tournament. But um, we are on him, you know, and, and make sure, you know, like he'll, he'll report every day, John, you don't look so good. I'm not feeling good. Go home. Get some sleep. You know. I met our middle son, Josh, was transplanted in 19, by, by Tyler, the other brother. Mm-hmm. Yep, so she was just nine months old. Yep. So, uh, yeah, so that's uh, Lambertville, Michigan, right on the border of Toledo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we use University of Michigan as our hospital, as our home hospital. Yep. Yeah. So that's basically us. Um, yeah, something, too, I think I, I talked about. Um, Dr. Pai and I spoke in Baltimore yeah, at the conference there. Um, and I found out they no longer use Cytoxin. Josh had Bucy, um, and she mentioned that they no longer use that as a myoblative. And I met with her afterwards because I was in shock. Um, my son does have some damage to his brain from Cytoxin. Um, I'm glad they're no longer using Cytoxin. Um, we never play coulda, woulda, shoulda. Um, I know a lot of patients who do, um, just in the realm of society. Um, my mother's a good one at that. Um, but we don't. If my son didn't have his transplant, he would be dead. He was in a car accident with a buddy who fell asleep at the wheel. Um, Josh had to be cut out of the windshield, so he would have lost his leg had he had still had with that and 30,000 platelets. So, um, we live with it. We, we live with what we have. Um, Josh still has his big bare heart. You know, he's a good kid. Um, he always helped Tessa through her math, you know, algebra, geometry, algebra two, all that. Um, he, he's a wizard when it comes to going anywhere to, um, like his, when he's building a deck or, or framing a barn or whatever, he can figure those mathematics in his head. He's very good with that, but he doesn't know what. Yeah, he, he, she was pulling some photos. We were dividing the kids' photos, baby photos, into boxes, you know, to give them to them. And she said, here's yours, Josh. He was looking at him, and he said, I wore glasses? And we're like, Josh, yes. I don't, 
I don't remember wearing glasses. So certain parts of his, his childhood are gone. He doesn't remember those kinds of things. Um, he cannot keep his banking straight. His dad has to do that for him. Certain things like that that he can't do. Um, he did have a stroke um, because University of Michigan did never, and I am going to put Josh in Dr. Cohen's um, study, because Dr. Or University of Michigan never followed him after one year. Um, and that is something that I brought to their attention. Um, so Josh's blood pressure started to climb and we were unaware. Um, he was on a ladder and when he started to get dizzy, he fell. And then of course, when he came to, his boss um, said, I, gotta, I need to call your dad. And Josh's first response was, don't call my dad, he has enough on his plate. Um, so the worst thing Josh did was go into his truck and take a nap and it was a stroke, so he shouldn't have done that. Um, by the time he went to the doctor for a sinus infection and they did a head CT and found this stroke, um, we went to a neurologist and I saw that um, damage. I was shocked. So, you know, now we're following him up with high blood pressure meds and, and aspirin a day and that kind of stuff, but um, he already told, you know, the head of the rough crew that he is not to be on a high ladder, things like that. But um, there was an episode where he did have to go on a, a tall ladder and, um, and Josh t sends a picture to his dad and says, I have to do this. There's no one here that will do it. And he's, D don't be stupid. You are not going on that ladder. You know, you will have another stroke. You will fall off, you know. So my husband had to go over there, you know, because he's still 16, really, and get off the ladder. You know, you can't do that. So certain things like that, you know, we have to, he does have to have a curfew um, because he's had two, two DUIs. We have to make sure he's got the car home um, because he'll do stupid things like a 16-year-old does. But, um, but he does bring the car home when, and when he's supposed to. Um, it, it's terrible that all his friends have passed him by and he's watched it and he knows it. His sister's passed him up, you know, and... It's, it's sad, it's really sad, but um, that's what we have, and so there it is. But, um, but there it is, what do you do? You know, that's, that's what we have, and he's alive, you know? So, um, that's so there it is, but I guess that's for doing your transplants when they're young, but we were not gonna tell his brother that we were not gonna fix him. We're only gonna fix your brother, sorry about your luck, so. Um, until the, he was older and better able to handle it. That's what we did, so that's what we chose. You know, we are living with that, so. Um, going back to your presentation yesterday, um, one thing I have always felt and still feel is that I am a disappointment to my parents because the only reason they had me they went through um, the tube reversal, the IVF, all that was so I could cure John, and I couldn't. So that's one thing I always have to live with, and uh, it still bothers me today, but um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, think, I feel like if John was worse than he is, um, if he wasn't able to do things, that I would feel even more bad about it, but because he's living um, a full life, um, it makes it easier, I guess, but I w think I will always feel that way. It's, a, it's interesting listening to you talk because you might not have been the match, but it sounds like based on what your mom said, in some ways you have been the reason that your brother is here and part of the cure and the connection, connection, connectivity that you have with him just in what you said, so it's interesting because I don't, I don't hear that at all. I hear you as you're part of the reason that he's here, so for what it's worth. Um, my name is Ray. I have a son, and my dad, of a Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. I think our stories mirror very similarly and it makes me, even to the point where, how, how old are you? 13. 13, okay. Okay, I just wondered, because my son is going to be uh, 10 years old in a week, so probably a similar birthday. Um, 
he was, they thought that, I just hear so much of every part, I'm sure all of you do, you, I, I'm just like, holy cow. Okay. Um, and so I'm just blown away by each of your stories and hearing all about your family, so I appreciate that greatly um, sitting here. Uh, my son, they told us what they thought the diagnosis was at 12 months. Um, they confirmed it at 14 months. Um, I left teaching at that time to be with him full time. Um, very similar story to the, you know, the bruising and the bruising quickly and wearing the helmet and um, me wondering, knowing that there's a low platelet level, but still wondering like, you know that on one level, but on the other level, you're like, how, why is this happening to my, you know, you put him down to bed, looks totally fine, and he wakes up with two black eyes. And you're questioning yourself and your family members, and, and it, it's interesting. So um, our son went to transplant at two years and three months. I have a lot of questions similar to you. He went through the transplant. It went pretty well. We lived in Los Angeles at the time. We did uh, decide to go up to Seattle to work with Dr. Ox and Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Um, we, we, at that time, we weren't comfortable with the plan that they maybe had in place at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. And as you all know, you start becoming advocates and asking mm -hmm. questions and trying to figure out what's going to be the best for your child, the best way to go about things. And so for us, that was uh, relocating up part of our family, relocating with our son Hunter to Seattle so he could go through transplant. Um, our daughter was six months of age at that time, and we made the difficult decision to leave her in Los Angeles uh, with the grandparents who were taking shifts, spending time with her. We felt that was um, the best so that we could focus on our son 100% and not have our daughter get lost in the shuffle of living at the Ronald McDonald House, being at the hospital 24 hours a day, and then what happens if she gets sick? Then we're having to split the family up even more. So that was hard. Um, missed her learning to crawl, missed her learning to walk, missed her learning to talk, missed her first birthday. Um, so down the road, that's one thing that I still have a lot of guilt about. A lot of shoulda, coulda, woulda. It's, it's hard, it's hard where we all are to not have that, um, to question those decisions that you make. So two years and three months that, uh, he was two years and three months when he went through transplant. Um, everything went really well quickly. Um, he did end up in the um, PQ, he developed Vino Occlusive, um, which, was, which was scary. Um, they were able to write that ship quickly because, as you know, that could be um, a death sentence, really, to be honest. Um, but that they got that squared away, and he is, um, I mean, he did well, very mild graft versus hope skin. He still had some issues um, at camp or at school, too much sun. If he's not, we're not paying attention, I mean, he uh, develops different rashes and different things. So you're like, whoa, what's going on, buddy? We need to get, you know. Um, but he's going to be 10. And someone asked me about him the other day. And I said, oh, I said he just graduated fourth grade. And I'm like, I just said he graduated fourth grade. But in a way, he kind of did, because when he's two years, three months, you're going through transplant, I didn't know if I was going to see three years old, much less third grade or fourth grade. So for us, Everything is a graduation. He graduated fourth grade. And um, you don't share that with a lot of people because they just, they honestly they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. But um, so I think we're at a point where maybe you are, where Matthew is. There's not a lot of information. What, after everything he's been through, what, what, now what? Um, but he's awesome, y'all. He is so, he is such a cool kid. Like, I'm so, like he's my hero because he's just so cool. <laughs> he's an old soul and I mean, he would come in here and want to chat all of you up. What's your story? 
and um, he doesn't remember a lot, but I'm surprised at some of the things he does remember. He'll ask me, why was it so loud? You know, why was there so much beeping going on all the time? And I had a red tube and a blue tube. Why did I have a red tube and a blue tube? Why couldn't I have had a green tube and a yellow tube? Or, you know, all of that stuff. So I am surprised at the things that he does remember going through that experience. But thank you guys for sharing and for listening. So I'm Don Johnson. Um, this is my dad, who I um, received my mutation from. So he is still here untransplanted. If you weren't here for the presentation, um, my son Roderick is in childcare. He will be turning seven in August, and he had his transplant December 2nd of 2015. So he's doing great. All his counts are great. Um, the one thing I forgot to say in my um, presentation is that the summer after New Orleans conference, we have a, um, a family friend who rides horse, and we've known him for probably seven years, and he had leukemia, and he went through two transplants. And I sat down and had a um, kind of an unplanned conversation. I'm sitting there and I'm like, I didn't want to ask him because I'm like, oh, this is so intrusive. And I'm like, I shouldn't, I'm like, Luke, I got to talk to you. <laughs> and he, um, and he was honest with me and he's like, you know, I, t I said, so, you know, the high, high chances of our boys having um, leukemia or lymphoma, you know, uh, without BMT is so great that, you know, I asked him, I said, you know, our doctors are kind of, you know, encouraging me to wait, but so many doctors encourage you to transplant, you know. Um, so since you've gone through transplant and you remember transplant, as he will remember transplant, um, should I do it now when he's younger or should I wait? And he didn't answer me, and I, I didn't think he was ever going to, and I'm like, I'm so sorry, you know, because I'm crying, he's crying. And he called me about 10 days later, and he's like, I, no, he didn't call me, I take that back. He's like, I'm, I'm texting you, I can't call you because I can't talk about this. But I'm, I will tell you, if I had the choice, I would have wanted it to be when I was younger, because I, would, I'm, I miss my family, I miss my friends, I miss my horse, I miss... You know, growing up in the country, being living in downtown Minneapolis, big change. It's culture shock. It was culture shock for us adults. You know, my husband didn't like to drive in the cities. Now he can drive in the cities. But, the, you know, there's so many other reasons. You know, it just, it just isn't one. And there is no right reason. But we transplanted. And um, we were right around transplant day. And Donna had posted on a, on a thread about cytoxin, and my son had cytoxin. So I was like, oh my gosh. So we went home, and I'm like Googling, you know. And my husband's like, it, it's done, you know. And he already had it. And so at the U, they do this ex um, big workup. Uh, they have like, they take this five-hour psychology test prior, and then he, j so I'm, was dreading his one year checkup knowing that they were going to do it again and seeing what was going to happen and I was like oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh um, and he did better on all the testing except for his processing speed which she said it could be just you know and knowing him now and then he was more focused then but he was also he had to be because we were always nagging him to pay attention pay attention you can't get hurt you can't get hurt you know you got to you know, and now we're just like, yep, yeah, go play. You know, so she's like, it could just be the fact that he didn't want to sit still or that he was overtired. She's like, don't overworry it. He's doing great. And um, since he had two months of kindergarten prior to transplant and then after kindergarten this year, um, he, so the first two months of kindergarten, he tested in like the 75th percentile when he, um, after kindergarten, he he's in the top 100% of his class in the state of Minnesota. So his brain is great, apparently. So hopefully, hopefully they fine-tuned it. And, and I don't know. But yeah, it's great to hear all your stories too. I suppose I have to talk now. 
Uh, I'm the grandpa to Roderick. <laughs> and if it wouldn't have been for him coming along, we'd never found out about me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I guess I lived a pretty good life. And I'm happy I got all my grandkids and my kids. Um, one thing I'd like to do, and I don't think it's ever going to happen, is I'd like to know a little bit more about uh, my family history. And uh, I lost two siblings, and I have uh, a cousin that uh, I don't know, was it two or three uh, babies that she lost? right shortly after birth and uh, well we don't get any news from them because since this was brought up they've never said anything about uh, whether they're involved in this or they, they won't talk about it so uh, but I'd like to I'd kind of like to know and it's something that we could pass down to the generations yeah. uh, in our family. But uh, if they're not interested in doing it, I guess we're not going to. But I guess I, I can push the doctors and probably find out where I sit as far as uh, immune stuff. And that might help. Right. I've, yeah, I've tried on myself uh, back when I had that uh, low platelet count, and there's nothing there other than I was in the hospital and they took a bone marrow sack, and that's the only thing I could find on that. So, and, and I can't even remember what the number yeah, was. That's for 10 years. I mean, they're supposed to keep it on microfiche for longer. Yeah, well, I don't know <laughs> if they had that. I mean, half the credit for 10 years and another X number of years on microfiche. Yeah. Um, it was 45 years ago. I don't know if they were using right. fish back then. <laughs> so, well, that's my story. So first off, I think I've been extremely lucky to be married to Samati. She is the strongest advocate a patient could ever have. And uh, Amalan is alive, I would say, thanks to prayers of all our families and grandparents, but even more so to Samati. She's given up her life for him and for the rest of our family. So I think uh, many of us are here because it's her passion for helping others with was that started the foundation and the conference. So I really am very thankful that um, she's there for anybody. It doesn't matter what time. Two in the morning, six in the morning, she's out there texting people in Israel, in uh, Yemen, in India, in Philippines, in Japan. So she's given it all to her family. So I think thanks to her, Amalan has survived. I think he's a pretty healthy kid, even though We've had our scary days. We thought he would uh, not survive past two. He's 18, doing very well in college. He's uh, doing an internship uh, in Maryland, working on what he likes, software and hardware for space systems. So he's, he's passionate about it. He's very smart. I think a lot of the credit goes to Samati and how she's raised our kids. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, we have, for us, we have two daughters who's older than my son who has Wiscott. My son who has Wiscott is now 18. And we have a younger son who's 12. He's here, he's healthy, thankfully. Okay. And uh, for us, when we got the diagnosis, he was 11 months old. He already had had a colitis, allergic, severe allergic colitis. We'd already been through low platelets and bumping and the terror, terror that comes with, my child is not gonna make it. 
and, and then we were thrown into the situation where transplant or not, and doctors, the immunologists were pushing not to transplant, the bone marrow transplant doctors were pushing us to transplant, and this is 1998. Internet was not there. XLT was a footnote in every paper. You read any medical paper, it was one line in the last. Oh, by the way, there are these patients who have mild Wiscar. They're okay. That was, there was no, yeah, there was no Google. And it, to us, that was the hardest part of the whole thing was just to make that decision to transplant or not. And then we had the cutoff of age five. So we had a time crunch. If you don't transplant by age five, they're not gonna make it. So it was just, that was probably the toughest. And to this day, sometimes we go back and we second guess ourselves and should we transplant? My son fell down twice in the bathroom and the 911 was called. So we go back and like, maybe we should have transplanted. So those thoughts keep coming back if he ever has a complication. Fortunately, he is a great kid. It's, it has affected either me more and his siblings more. He has sailed through it. He wrote his essays for his 12th grade, I mean his admission to college. There was no mention of Fuska. He never wrote about his disease. It was not part of his anything because his sisters read his essays. He said, Mom, he never talked about his disease, which was amazing. Not one word. And he got a full scholarship to college. Apparently, he never told them to, because when I talked to them afterwards about his condition, they're like, oh, we didn't know. <laughs> so he has lived with Wiscott. He is dealing with Wiscott beautifully. The terror that we go through, the sacrifices that each and every one of us have made. And at an age, but it's not that he doesn't know. At age four, I started talking to him and telling him about his disease. I told him I gave it to him, essentially. And he told me, he said, why did everybody not get it in the family? So I told him I have low platelets. I sort of have low thing. At age nine, he came up to me of his own accord and he told me, and this is important for carriers, which is why I'm sharing this. He said, Mom, don't feel bad that you gave me this disease. You would never have done this had you known. You would never do something bad to me knowingly. So I just wanted to share this because I am sure every Wiscard boy probably feels this way. The mothers carry the guilt and the Wiscard boys don't seem to. So let ourselves go free. So we have a wonderful 18-year-old. We still struggle. We don't know what to do. We're hoping gene therapy will come along. We're hoping something will come along in the meantime. The Wiscott Forum was an amazing place. One of the best places to be is with the Wiscott families who understand us. So thank you to each and every one of you who come to the forum and share your stories because I became a different person after I opened the forum in 2009. I was a more sane, person because I connected with, I could connect with families who understood. So thank you to each and every one of you and special thanks to Christina who I always call and bug in the middle of the night. My daughter is not feeling good. Can you talk to her? So, and she does. So, but thank you to each and every one of you because you are my source of support. And I, in return, I will say, I don't thank him enough, but it's not been easy on Trader. He's a guy, which is why I gave him the microphone first. I whine, I complain, I moan, and you know, guys are just supposed to go on, and he does. And it, he does it willingly, and when I go off and worry about my child, he's my rock. Have you ever kids been checked for their HLA for your son? Oh, none of them. We don't have a match in the world. My son does not have a match. He has a half load. The best match he has is a half match. We struggled, even with the half match, we struggled with the decision to not transplant. So that was our story. So thank you to each and every one of you who support. Thank you. you know, and, and I agree. I mean, it's just hearing the stories, I think it must be that way for so many of you in the room. It's like how much it resonates and kind of being around a group of people like it is on that. Facebook page, which is so helpful for me, people who instantly get it, you know, you can write about something and it's not like, you know, how many people that you talk to at work know what Wiscott Aldrich syndrome is? Nobody knows, nobody gets what the decision to go through a transplant or not, or if you do, what is a transplant? I mean, most people don't get it. So it's uh, so powerful. And I, and I was thinking about what you were saying about the disappointment again, because I think in what Sumathi was saying, us mothers who are carriers kind of feel a similar feeling to what you kind of mentioned, you know, this, gosh, what did I do to my son? You know, like you're, you're kind of almost carrying that same guilt in a different way, but it's a similar thing that many of us have to, 
you know, grapple with. Um, but I think that you just, you have to like see it and kind of go, I, if I could control it, I would have done it different, <laughs> which we, we, we couldn't control it, you know? And so you just kind of have to be um, with it and know that, you know, something that kind of is also shared is something about Wiscott makes some really fantastic little um, in older human beings, you know, something about this illness um, really is f phenomenal. So I guess I wanted, how much time, much more time do we have? We have half an hour or something until 11, yeah, right? 11. Is that half an hour? Okay, with this coffee and cookies. Okay, so with, what time is it? So we have about half an hour. So, so, but let's plan half. Okay, so um, I guess my question is kind of what things would people like to talk about um, now? I mean, some of the thoughts that I had and that came up during this conversation were especially, you know, kind of how it works out in this group. Half of us have gone through a transplant, half haven't. A lot of the XLT wonder about making that decision or thinking about it a lot, kind of thinking and sharing thoughts amongst ourselves about that about that decision. Another thought that I was thinking about was kind of how to talk to daughters about carrier status, potential carrier status, or sons about different issues post-BMT. Um, those seem to be thoughts that, you know, I'm not getting too satisfying um, answers from the, you know, these really fantastic doctors about, because I think it's not, it's not crystal clear. So it might be something that we could do together, but I'm open to other ideas. about um, is how everyone handles doctors in general. I think that's my Great biggest <laughs> struggle is like, oh, you should be on prophylaxis. You shouldn't. And now I'm here again and the doctors are like, no, I mean, his immune system is fine. So I'm getting um, just getting a whole bunch of different answers. You don't really know which one to do, which one to follow. Um, and that's really tough. And then going back to Toronto and sitting there in front of the doctors and saying, but I went to NIH and they said he should be on this one. And then actually, no, I'm not going to put him on it. And they all hate me. They think I'm horrible. Like they, I've had a really hard time dealing with the doctors um, in Toronto. Anyway, if anyone has any tips on just really how to tell your doctor no, for example, that would be very nice. <laughs> Well, uh, I think that I'm in negotiation for a doctor, or we, my wife and myself, for the last eight years. So we have, um, I think that we have educated them in a way, because um, I just want to share a small story so you understand about doctors. That my son was born, he was born in one hospital. Then he, they thought it is a, what is called naid, the antibodies of the mother to the platelets of the son. And he was um, just four months follow up in the um, hematological um, uh, department. And we asked the doctor what's going on. And he said, oh, we will wait uh, more than one year and maybe it will disappear somehow. And we, we have a friend, um, and uh, I have a friend in Vancouver who is a professor of pediatrics. Uh, he told me it looks like something else. And we just bought a book, you know, about thrombocytopenia, and we read it, you know, from cover to cover, and we decided that it is not. Then we came to the doctor and say, okay, look, that's what he bought. That's what we look like. It's one of those two. That's what we think. So can you check it? And the doctor want, uh, agreed to check one of them, which is something else, not Wiscott, which was negative, and then it was a Wiscott. And then we asked him, did you look at uh, the blood, you know, with the microscope to see if the plates are small? And he said, uh, I did, which later I discovered that he didn't. And um, we just um, talked with other doctors in the same hospital, and we, they told us, okay, go to the other hospital, there's someone there, which is our doctor now, and um, ask to do this test, because she's doing that. And that's how it goes, okay? And that means that you have, even the first time that you don't know anything, yeah, I think that you must question what's going on, because um, there's a limit, I would say, that except for a very small amount of centers that have a very, I would say, 
a lot of experience, like Great Ormond Street or others here in the US, they saw quite a lot of uh, whisker. Uh, some others may, uh, and this was a very big hospital, the biggest in Israel, and it's something that is personal. Who is the doctor? What is the experience? You have to feel it somehow. And if you don't think this is the right doctor, change it. You don't, don't, that's, that's my opinion, you know. And uh, I can tell you that we went to the other doctor, who is um, our doctor now, and she's a hematologist. Now she don't, all the first six years, she didn't look about his immune system. We didn't do even one test for the first six years. He was looking about his platelets, okay? Because she's a hematologist. And hematologists look at the platelets. Immunologists don't look at them. They say, oh, it's okay. If you don't bruise, it's okay. So each one of them has his own perspective, and, and you have to take it very um, carefully. And you think that actually when I'm thinking about, well, his, I would say, mild mutation, and I, although I know that in the, what we know now, that in the 20s, 30s, he may be exposed to, to some other problems like autoimmunity or malignancy, and the thrombocytopenia is mainly probably the, the problem of the childhood now because it is is very active, you know, so uh, there might be trauma or other things with a lot of um, injuries. So still, when we are six years with her, she was looking only on one side of that. It means, and she didn't allow us to do some things, and we did, because we decided to do. So I think the change was, my change was in 2010, when I went to Chicago to, to the first Wiscott conference which was not through the IDF, and I found it very useful. Then I came back home and I told her, okay, that's what happened outside. Look, that's what happened. I, I took video of all the, the, the presentation and I sent it to her. She looked at it. Okay, I know, she told me. And, and she treated uh, five Wiscott cases before, okay, which is quite good for Israel. There are only 23 cases at all. So you can give them data and discuss it with them. And even if they say no for something, you should feel, in my opinion, you should take your feelings and, and go with it, mm -hmm. okay? She told me not to fly. We didn't fly for, um, you know, outside of Israel. <coughs> and this had some um, price on my daughters. They want to go outside. They wanted to go to London, I don't know, to other places. So just the last two months, we decided to do it, okay? And she still insists we should not go. So I, I called Professor Trasher and Ox, and I called about three or four of them, and Condotti, and they all say, there's no problem, no greater risk if you go. There's always a risk, you know, that, but you have to decide. That means that you have to somehow take your own decision based on your knowledge, which for me, some people, you know, for me, it's one way of looking at it, but for me, knowledge is, is, is a good thing, and it's also sometimes a bad thing because um, it makes you, you know, I'm an engineer, so everything is very clear to me if I go, you know, step by step. So you go, you check it, then you check the other thing, then you have your own, you know, decision tree, and then you decide, okay? But there are other things which are not like that. Uh, some of them are emotional, or some of them are um, things that instincts that uh, if you go that way, maybe it makes you a little bit harder. So you have to, I think you have to balance between both of them. And I know that for myself, I'm on more of the, you know, organized side that is uh, looking for uh, data, um, somehow. Yeah, uh, it's just very shortly, just uh, I somewhat what Amir said, trust your instincts and mainly just look at your kids because um, when we were uh, first hospitalized, when they made the, all the, um, they found out the mutation. So we first, we came with a very low number of platelets and they ran millions of tests. And one of the tests, um, they looked for bacteria or some infection. So they did, um, looked for bacteria in the blood and it came, uh, the results were posit positive for some bacteria, I don't remember. And they said, okay, we have to put them on antibiotics. And I was like, Look at the kid. Does he look sick to you? He doesn't have a fever. He's happy. He's smiling. He's not sick. And they insisted on the antibiotics, and they said, look, we can't, we, we can't know. And so I said, okay, you know, if you have to do it, you have to do it. And then they repeated the test, and it was negative. So it was a false positive. 
And I was like, look at the kid. He is not sick. So really, that's my, and now also when after we found out the mutation, so we're um, treated by this uh, immunologist that, you know, he knows about whisker, but how much does he know? He doesn't know much. And he immediately said, we have to put him on a prophylaxis, on antibiotics. And I was like, but he's not sick. I mean, he, he, he hasn't been sick for six or seven or eight months. He's okay. I'm not putting him on antibiotics. And I just didn't, because he was not constantly sick. He's, and actually, what really helped us was um, um, meeting Amir uh, with all of his experience. So, um, and also the group, uh, the Facebook group. And I think that exposing yourself to as many other people with experience and sh knowing, you know, information and how people, other people deal with it, and what do they do in the same situations, and consulting, just consulting with many other people, and with all of this information, eventually have your own decision based on your instincts and just looking at your kid. So I, I found something very useful that it's kind of the same sort of situation with you. So I'm in the U.S. Navy, and our medical medical care in the U.S. Navy is very similar to like, like what you're explaining. I don't have an option for my family where, what doctor they see. She, she and the children can't just leave and say, well, I don't like the service I'm getting from you and pick someone else. It's, they're, they're working with a Navy captain, is my son's hematologist right now, who's learning with my son as a guinea pig. Well, when I came, before he came to San Diego, we had, on the East Coast, there wasn't a naval hospital there where we had to go to, so we had to do what everyone else had to, an HMO or healthcare with the U.S. and pick our doctor, and it worked out great. We were at CHOP, Children's Philadelphia Hospital. Uh, so when we went to San Diego and we had to IFTP this fall with my son, um, the naval doctor was very cut and dry, and he does mainly uh, treating leukemia uh, children and was pushing us down the bone marrow transplant route. And she and I just felt again like, well, we had no options. We had no second opinion or people to talk to. So she reached out to our resources, Samanthi and uh, Buffy from NIH. And was we were fortunate enough where she could coordinate getting Dr. Ox and Dr. Kendati and uh, all these doctors on a conference call to where she could sit there and make sure that the doctor took their input and their advice. So it, was, it wasn't coming necessarily from her, even though she was saying the same things to the doctor, but him being able to hear it from the experts in the disease to where she could not only have her questions answered, the doctor could have his questions answered, and we felt like the, that doctor was getting the direction that, that he needed instead of making his own decisions. I so, think what it comes down to is, I've run into this with a lot of doctors, is I think they're afraid that in any job, if it's your job, if you're a carpenter and someone comes to you to build a chair and you're like, I'm not really good at building chairs, I'm not familiar, you look like you're supposed to know what you're talking about. And if you're a hematologist or an immunologist, you're supposed to know this rare thing that one in 100,000 children are born with. So I think it, they run into being afraid to say that they're not familiar 
Like, I used to think it was funny when we first got diagnosed with CHOP. Um, we, I would think it was funny to go to a new pediatrician when our pediatrician retired and to watch them read it or for me to say Wiscott and they excuse themselves because I knew they were going to Google it or to look for it. And I just thought it was funny because I would, I would rather you just admit that you're not familiar with it. Maybe talk to an expert in the room before you can talk to another expert. And I've been lucky that we've kind of gotten, and maybe it's just the way that I kind of don't expect or allow anything else. You're gonna t listen to what I have to say because you know I, you are a hematologist. You are an on, you are whatever. I'm a Davidologist, so like I trump all the other ologists. <laughs> so um, and I've been lucky that doctors have been open to kind of admit and take on other advice. And Dr. Kandati has been one of them where, I mean, that call that was made with my immunologist, the hematologist, Dr. Ox, Dr. Kandati, it was like four o'clock in the morning in Switzerland and he was on the call. And David was, Dave, they were at um, Rady or Balboa getting a rituximab. And so I was at home and they were at the hospital and we were like, everybody was in a different room. And it was really nice, but I think you have to find doctors and maybe it comes with the confidence because when I first started I listened to every doctor and then I had all these different doctors and it was scary. Now I have more confidence in my opinion and so I think that it opens them up to admit that maybe they could take even my expertise. So as you get more comfortable with the disease and you've got more, you feel like you have support under your belt, I think the confidence will help you to like to show And there's so much so struggling with, okay, I know what's right, but how do I say it? That's just not really my personality either. I'm not, I, I find it difficult. I don't want to, you know, muddy the waters or be that person that's like, sorry, no. I mean, there's times I've done it, but that's just not me. So I think, yeah, I think you're right. Building Somebody up. doesn't like you because you advocate mm -hmm. for your child. Exactly what I was going to say. I, I think I started out like you. I, you go in blindly trusting that doctors know what they're talking about, and through the process, you've learned that they're human too. And I, I think like with Sam, his pick, what, like you know how it is with all of our children, they're not diagnosed as Wiscott Aldrich right away, so you're going through all these different tests, and he gets a pick line, um, and it comes out, and I take it to him to the doctor, and they said they're just going to stitch it in with nothing. And I said, you're going to do it with nothing? And he's like, oh, he'll cry for a little bit, but it'll be okay. And I was like, I wouldn't even want you to do that to me. And he's looking at me, he's like, so you want your son to have no pain? Yes, we'll reschedule this until he can get some kind of anything. Um, and so it start, you start, and I look back and there's so many other things that, you know, like you said, you can't do the coulda, shoulda, woulda. And it's, it just gets me so angry about different things that either I wish I would have reported or I wish, and so through the process, you become, you get, you get that backbone and you become an advocate for your child and you wonder why hospitals don't have strong patient and parent advocates because so many people do just, and I sat there and I thought how many parents would not know any better and they would let their kid, you know, do that. And that, you know, another time like his, like his, uh, pork kept coming out and they said, well, it was then when we did the, um, when I took the x-ray after the surgery, and I said, yeah, but when he came out of anesthesia, he bent backwards and it popped out. And so the x-ray doesn't show that. So you start becoming an advocate. Um, I breastfed him when he was born, and he got to a point where he wasn't eating. So lucky for me, the two doctors had differing opinions that were on the team, but one of them at night put the feeding tube through and put him on um, like formula and he had never had it, wasn't used to it, and was, it made things worse. And the other doctor came in the morning and she's like, get him off that formula and you know, breastfeeding's the best thing for him. Um, and I thank God for her to come and, and do that. And I thought, okay, now I know I can advocate, like you said, be the Samologist or be your child's you know, number one advocate because nobody else will. I, I really believe you have to be the strongest advocate and you will start just speaking up and, and sharing your knowledge with them. But don't be afraid. Don't, be, don't think that you're wrong because you're not wrong. And it's your child. No, I think that they're great, especially when we have, we have about 15 more. And I do have oh. a picture with everybody in the band. So even if you haven't got a side, <laughs> whether or not you 
I wanted to mention one thing, though, that I noticed when I was taking my son to the hospital for um, IVIG, and he kept getting some rash that doctors thought was a fungal infection. One of the nurses told me, like, you know what, it's a hospital, maybe you should consider doing it at home because there are a lot of people coming here. And then I guess his uh, uh, manager overheard or something. Um, I think that nurse got in trouble for telling me that. And it kind of made me really upset. I know there are a lot of people here who like to sue for everything, but I really appreciated his opinion. I, I thought that, I, I mean, I knew already about that possibility, but I really appreciate when nurses and doctors speak up and tell what they think. But I don't know how to really resolve this problem because everybody is afraid of being sued. Yeah. And it's... Something similar in this for example, we went a few times at the beginning, we went a few times to the ER when we had fever, you know, that was the interaction. We negotiated with the doctor, and we never talked to them. Never. Yeah, if you have fever, we went to do the checking, and we went home at night, and if they want, we can come in the morning, because we didn't want them to be in this way. And the, the, that generally, today, of course, if we are not going to be out in the morning, generally, it's just something that can happen. But I think that the, the doctor allowed us because she thinks that we should take good care of her, she can try. Mm -hmm. And she knows that if he's in the ER, one room, that means that he's not going to take care of her. In general, he's just sitting there, trying to get out. So you can, I think you can negotiate everything with the doctor. You just have to come with your own very, a lot of confidence that you're, you, they can trust you, and if something is going wrong, right. you will come. Right. That means that... It, it's tough, though. It is tough sometimes. It's very tough. And I'm a physician. And maybe sometimes because I'm a physician, it's tougher. Because they are like, oh my God, do you understand? I mean, you should transplant your son. You're a doctor. You can transplant your son. It's the, not, the looks I get is like, what? You're a doctor? You can do it. But I went out against, it's called against my health plan. So they wanted to transplant my son. He was not leaving. But he was like, I don't care. I just flat out refused. Which was the first time I had done something like that. It was terrifying for me too. But I literally said no. They fortunately they didn't make me sign the actual paperwork because there's an actual paperwork for against medical advice, but that was against medical advice. That was the first time I just said put my foot down. I still hear from the doctors about it, about how I walked out. This is fifteen years later. They are still mad at me that I walked out that day without a transfusion. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the added complexity to it is that, like, you are in some situations really beholden to that. So, so you know, if you're stuck in the hospital, you don't want to become the bad patient. So I, I remember that I was like, oh my gosh, the nurse, you know, you got to be make nice and like, you know, but still advocate and run that really thin line. Yep. It's just very um, challenging. I think some of the key words, and I, I want to, I, I see, is like, doctors, if you have the opportunity to change, I noticed in the room different people had different experiences with different physicians, right? You just got to find the one that works right for you that you trust if you can switch now with this situation you can't switch in that situation some of the key words that doctors are using now is shared decision making so they're supposed to be learning that they're supposed to be a back and forth with the patient about what the best decisions are and so i do think this this is a great idea to kind of say hey how can we make this decision together and and you can even say, if you feel comfortable, and it depends on the situation, hey, I'm feeling uncomfortable, like I, I shouldn't say my opinion. Is that right? Or are you, are you open to me kind of expressing myself here? There's ways of saying it that, that with this particular person where you're kind of stuck with just them. And then if they would respond to the experts, because doctors do tend to really like that 
getting the expert there and, and hear, they hear it differently from the expert than they do from you. And so it's like getting the expert can help. And there's so many of these doctors here who are so dedicated that would get on the phone for free as a consultation and talk to your doc. And I would, yes, you, you have to do that a little bit, like this is, this is an, and drop the name and the place there, are, oh, at Boston Children's, and, and you're so good, but it, but it's tricky, and I know you get this, and then I don't know if there's something else, we're going to get kicked out of this room. Yeah, I want to just mention this one thing. Um, okay. I also was a bad patient, and this saved my son John's life. When he was diagnosed with, with testicular cancer, when he was, 18. Um, and this, I know this to just be God's hand. Um, when I am nervous, I clean like crazy. And I was cleaning his ho hotel room, his hospital room. I picked up the People magazine and I just fanned through it. And my thumb stopped at the book pages, which up until then I never read for pleasure. I read for research only. Um, and there was the Lance Armstrong story. And up until this point, they were going to treat him U of M's way. They were going to up and remove the testicle, even though they had no proof this is where it came from. This was a seminoma in his chest, but that came out to be not lymphoma, but testicular cancer. They started him on bleomycin, which gave him a huge, terrible reaction um, with fever, and they just said, oh, it's, uh, it's a tumor, uh, it's going after the tumor, that's why this is doing this. So, and it was Lance Armstrong's story about testicular cancer that was in his brain. Um, I read the excerpt grabbed my keys, told John I'll be right back, ran down to Barnes & Noble, which was two miles away, came back, I stayed up all night reading this book. Um, in there he mentioned Dr. Larry Einhorn, who was at Indiana University. Um, next morning I called Indiana University. Um, he got on the phone himself. Dr. Einhorn was not in town when, doc when Lance Armstrong was diagnosed, his colleague was. When I explained everything that was going on, he gave me his private line. I paged Dan Wexler, who now is the head of Duke's Hemonk at Pease. I don't know if you know him, Smothy, or not. Um, and I paged Dan. He ran up the seven flights of stairs. He's out of breath. He looks at me and he said, what's up? I hand him the note. He looked at me and he said, you called Larry Einhorn? And I said, yes. And he said, I am on it. He comes back 20 minutes later and he said, Donna, we're changing everything. He said, Larry Einhorn is now in charge. He right. said, he is going to run this show from the rest of the way. He said, I'm just going to do whatever Larry says. He is the leader in testicular cancer of the world. He said, I'm FedExing him all John's results. We're changing the chemo. We're changing everything. He's going to cure John in four months. So we let Dr. Einhorn run everything, and four months later, his cancer was gone, including the shell of the tumor, which U of M said would, um, even Dr. Einhorn said that shell would always be there. Um, John has been cancer-free now. He's 35. So Dr. Wexler, God bless him, he copped no attitude. He took orders from Dr. Einhorn. After that four months, we went to Indiana U and we met him. Um, he was like a little Einstein. Um, he was so glad to meet John. It was his first Wiscott testicular cancer case ever. And he ran it just like um, every other show he ran. And that's where we learned to use Vin Christine to raise his platelet count um, through an ITP and we still use it today. So there was a case of a doctor not copying an attitude by using another doctor's um, protocols, and, and it worked for us. So. Yeah, that's really the last case, and this is advice for all patients. Our Wisconsin doctors are amazing. So once the conference is over, I send an email of all our doctors. They are just the down-to-earth people. You can email any one of them, and they will respond to you and give you the answers that you want. And if there's an important case, like we're deciding, they're not going to call for every sniffle, but they'll call if you're transplant or not. They will get on the phone with your doctors. So please feel comfortable to reach out to them. That's what they are there for, especially people like doc who are on our board, like Dr. Kendari, Dr. Ox. They are on our board, and they will do this for you. So do not hesitate. Do not feel afraid to call them. Because there's, there's not many of us. <laughs> you know, they do studies on 37 people.
you know, in published studies on 37 people. This is unheard of in, in most other fields of medicine. And so your question now and what you're doing now isn't going to bother them because they don't have a lot of people at your stage right now that are going through that. I think they're struggling now trying to figure out stuff like what happens years after a transplant, how to have growth stuff, you know, whatever it is, the other things, but not an XLT. Like yeah. Not a doctor that we gotta we gotta go, but thank you all so much.